Thank you. Hi. So I'm Yannick. I'm working as a backend engineer at Stylefruits, and um, we have a ton of closure systems at the backend, messaging queues and APIs, user-facing stuff. And so there is data flowing all throughout the system. So I started thinking about what, for me, is the perfect data source, which is clearly a very slides. <laughs> OK, so uh, back to the slide. That's the talk. So I was uh, thinking about what's the perfect data source, which is clearly a very unopinionated and subjective topic. And for me, it's this. You can see it has a nice shape, four layers, a pleasing gray. And um, what makes it so perfect for me is that I can ask it for something, let's say a cube, and it will give me a cube. It's very simple. I can ask it for a red cube, for a different kind of cube, for some variation of the cube, and it will give me exactly that cube. What that means is there is one endpoint that I can query for whatever I need. There is one maximum shape it can output. There are dimensions to that shape that I can ask for, that I can get individually. And it's completely self-contained. So there is no unnecessary data in that cube. It's just a cube. It has sides, it has edges. It doesn't matter. In Clojure, this would look approximately like this. So a function that gets a data source, uh, some data structure describing what I want from this cube, and then it would give me that cube. Let's not concern ourselves with the details there. There's an ellipsis. If I wanted to use this data source, I would start from a view that describes what I want to present. I would build a query describing what cube I need. I would fetch it. I would transform it and eventually display it. This doesn't really work in reality because it doesn't exist. I mean, in simple cases, sure, but more likely you have a federation of those perfect data sources. You have one that gives you a house, users, uh, cars, tiny robots. And um, the basic principles still hold. So there's one endpoint, but this time per shape. They all have different queryable dimensions that I can ask for. So I can have a house with roof, without roof, flat roof, I don't care. And all the results are still self-contained. There is no unnecessary data. But there is multiple of those entities. So I would have multiple of those wonderfully simple functions that would give me houses, people, and so on and so on. Using those is still relatively simple. I would start with my view again. I would build a query for the houses, and I would build a query for the people. I would query them, and then I would bring everything together to present it to the user. Um, looks nice, but... Uh, I forgot a slide. There is, uh, obviously, if you look at that, uh, you can see that those are completely independent, and that makes them very nicely parallelizable. So you could use futures, you could use, I don't know, thread pools, whatever floats your thread. And um, in the end, you bring everything together again. What happens is that's still not very realistic. In reality, they are not that self-contained. There are references between different entities. For example, we have a house. In that house, there live people. People, they have a registered address pointing back at the house. They might own a car. The car itself might also be registered at a house. So everything for perfect data sources from before, it still holds. But now there are explicit dependencies between those things. And this is what we encounter most of the time, for example, in linked data, REST APIs, whatever. And um, you have document for an entity, and it points at other documents somewhere. Also true for relational databases with foreign key constraints, stuff like that. Working with that data is a bit more tedious, because, again, you will start with a view. You will get some object, for example, a series of people based on a view. This is the top two lines. And since they own cars, and you want to display which cars they own, you fetch the car references that are contained within the person record, you build a query out of that, and then you fetch the cars. And in the end, 
you have to bring it all together again. So you have to attach the cars to the people, take the result, transform it for your view. The problem with that is you have to know where the references are to find them. Then once you have the references, you have to know where to query the actual documents that are referenced by those references. More stuff includes, you have to know which uh, order to fetch those elements in. Maybe it matters, maybe there is an optimal order that you can use. You still have to think about, can I parallelize things? Maybe there are independent entities, maybe there aren't. And then there is other stuff like, uh, if I have the same entity type on different levels in my tree, maybe I can just fetch them all together instead of first fetching it up there and then fetching it down there again. We can add another level here. For example, the cars, as I mentioned, are registered at some address. So we might want to find that address. Now, we have a series of cars. We um, extract the, the address, the house references from those cars. People also have addresses. We might want to show that too. So in the same turn, we fetch the addresses from those people. We build a new house address <coughs> subquery. We fetch it. Then we have to attach it, if you look on the top, uh, bottom two lines, we have to attach it to each entity individually, and then we have to attach the cars that now have addresses back to the people. We transform everything nicely for the view, and we shove it in the user's face. Um, you can add more layers there, and there might also be a requirement for different variations of the same type being pres presented, maybe from the cars, you only want the city, maybe from the, uh, the car address. From the person address, you maybe want the zip city, the zip code, the, I don't know, uh, level of the house they're living in. And so you might have to split this whole process up. So now you're fetching uh, people house references and car house references uh, individually. You're building queries that are individual. You are performing the fetches. You're bringing everything back together. and. Obviously, you notice that this is the perfect opportunity to optimize, so you add a more complexity by adding futures. Parallelism. Now, um, I want you to think about adding another layer of data fetches to this. If you're not crying, you haven't thought about it enough. And the sad thing is, all we're trying to do is we start out with, out with very simple, what I call perfect data sources, which is these fetch houses and fetch cars and whatnot. And we're trying to build up another perfect data source. If you look at the signature of fetch view data, it just gets a compound data source and a description of the view, and it should, it's supposed to spit out whatever I need there. So why is this so hard? Why do we have to think about things that we don't really want to think about? For example, Reference, locations, and format. We have to know where exactly references are, I already mentioned that. And we have to also know what the information contained in those references actually means. There is an implicit contract of if I have an ID in this field nested here, I have to query this endpoint to get the actual data. It gets easier with uh, some linked data concept where you have hrefs and actual URIs or URLs pointing at things and you can know, okay, I can get this and I can just fetch it again, but you still have to know this. Then there's other things like fetching order and parallelism. There is an optimal way to do this. You want to achieve this optimal way, but sometimes this means you have to do a lot of thinking, a lot of writing, and the code might not look very nice. Then there's stuff that you, that you haven't even thought about, probably. Uh, for example, redundant fetches. If you fetched already the Lamborghini somewhere, and it pops up again as a reference somewhere. You don't have to fetch it again. You already have this data somewhere, but you might still fetch it because you haven't thought about this. And the other thing is, what if the Lamborghini changed between the first fetch and the second fetch? Now you have the same thing in two different location in your tree, locations in your tree, but it looks completely different, or marginally different, probably. Along comes Huxle, and Huxle is a Haskell library, I'm sorry. And um, it claims to simplify access to remote data such as databases or web-based services. It tries to solve a few of the problems that I showed you. It uh, achieves implicit concurrency using applicative functors, big words, and implicit caching. 
What that means, simpler, is instead of writing uh, fetch this, transform this, bring it together here, do another fetch, and so on, you build up an abstract tree, an abstract description of your data fetching and transformation processes. And um, this allows Haxel to actually analyze your goal and to make decisions for you that would improve overall optimal data fetching order, parallelism, and so on. It, for example, could mean you want to fetch the common friends of two people friends, two people's friends. Uh, you would first fetch the friends of one, friends of the other. You would bring them together and fetch their friends as a set again, and uh, then you build the intersection of that, and you get the result. Now, instead of doing that, as I mentioned, by hand and doing each step, you just describe it. In the end, you have a tree. And Huxley will realize that every time you are calling map M, which is basically mapping over the results, doing things, uh, or applying a function to two different subtrees, you can parallelize. And you, can, you have the opportunity to improve the overall performance of the thing. Because, it, you, as you see, you can fetch the friends of ID 1 and the friends of ID 2. I hope you also can follow my explanation over here. <laughs> um, you can fetch them in parallel. Then you can fetch all the friends of those friends, again, completely in parallel. But Hexel will, allow you, will do this for you without you actually having to think about it. Now, I'm even more sorry. Um, this is what it would look like-ish. Uh, you would d declare a type uh, friend request and uh, a data source that's able to handle those friend requests. And uh, in the end, you would write code that just operates using those friend requests. So for example, common friends of friends uh, would look like this, which is just the textual representation of the tree I showed you. <coughs> and it fetches the friends, fetches the friends, fetches more friends, and it creates the intersection of that. Now, if you call this function, nothing will happen you will just have a description of what you're about to do, or what you're trying to do. To actually convert this or transfer this into the real world, you would call run Hexel, which is a function by Hexel which executes your abstract description of I.O. And in the process, parallelizes all the things it can parallelize, um, and batches all the things it can batch, and caches all the intermediate results so you don't have to fetch them again once the opportunity arises. We have a similar thing in Closure Land. It's called Muse, and there's a fork of it called Urania. And it's basically a port of Hexel's concept with slight difference uh, into Closure. And it says, their PR department says that um, it's a closure library that works hard to make your relationship with remote data simple and enjoyable. Was it, what it does is really basically porting Hexel. Uh, it implements functors. It uh, leverages protocols and records to declare data sources. And this leads to very elegant code, as we might see. And it uses core async channels for concurrency, but it's just a design choice. Uh, you don't really have to. And data sources in Muse are declared as records. You just describe a friends of record, giving it a field, parameters basically, uh, for example, ID, and you implement this data source protocol saying, ah, if I want to fetch friends of ID, do the following. In this case, fetch the friend IDs, make a set. Uh, here is a difference between the Hexel thing and the closure thing, because in Hexel, data sources fulfill requests. So the data source is the operating part. It gets request description and it executes them. In uh, news, the request knows it has to query a data source. So in one case, data source gets request. In the other case, the request gets the data source and then knows what to do with it. There are facilities for composition. For example, to just count the friends of a person, you would do you would call fmap and count on this, or to do the intersection as that we already saw. Uh, there's a bind there, so if you want to create another description of data fetching out of an already performed fetch, you would do something like this. So you would get the friends, uh, look at the first friend, and get uh, their friends. And the final one, which is obviously called traverse. Um, would just do the same thing, but over a sequence. 
So you could get the friends of, uh, of someone, traverse over it, and for each one, fetch more friends, do something with the results. This leads to the good of Muse, which is it's, again, very declarative. You just write code as you would imperatively, but under the hood, you get an abstract description that can be optimized, statically analyzed even, and um, you would you just pass it to the run function, which just transfers it into the real world by actually executing it. You might now think, ah, but this could be very inefficient because for friends of friends, doing one request for every friend, this might just explode. So Muse offers uh, ways of batching things. Um, you can implement a batch source protocol that, you, that just gets all the users takes them and can then produce results for all things at once. But there's also a downside to the whole thing, which is code like this, which does a very simple thing. It performs one fetch, a user by name, and then it tries to do another fetch and attach it to the previous result. So in this case, you would fetch the user by name, it looks up the ID in the user, um, it declares, okay, now fetch me the friends of that user, and afterwards it tries to s it back into the user. Looking at that, it's really hard to grasp the resulting shape of uh, this data fetch operation. It will be just a hash map containing user data plus the key friends, but it's really hard to see that, which I don't like about the Muse thing. Um, then there's Urania. It's just a fork of Muse. I will be very quick with this, uh, make some design decisions like using promises instead of core async channels. Uh, it, it renames some functions because uh, it apparently map is better than fmap and mapcut is better than flatmap. And um, it allows passing of an environment to the fetch function, which if you noticed previously in Muse, there is no such thing like environment. So uh, all the things you need to perform your things, all the dependencies, they have to be declared globally or in some dynamic binding or uh, declared explicitly as um, fields in the records. But we can take Muse and we can check how we fared in uh, our checklist here. Uh, so for example, soundness, which was if I fetched the same thing twice and it, diff it changed in between, is this still a problem? It's not. Muse will cache things just like Hexel and it will make sure if you fetch the same thing, you get the same result. Redundant fetches, same thing. Um, it was cached, so if I have seen, seen something before, I will just reuse the result of that. And most importantly, fetching order and parallelism. Also a check mark because it will just do that for you. You don't have to think about parallelism. You're writing code as if you are fetching stuff sequentially, in the worst possible way, maybe even, and it will just bring stuff together as good as well as it can and um, optimize it for you. But Reference locations and the format, these are still a problem. You have to know what the result of a certain fetch operation is, and you have to know where in there is information that you could use to do another fetch, right? All relations between um, entities and data sources, they are still implicit. There is nothing that you can use there. So mm, along comes something that people sitting here have heard in the previous talk, GraphQL. GraphQL is a query language, and it says you should describe your data, you should ask for what exactly you want, and you will get predictable results. What it means is you can write queries like this, saying, oh, I write the common friends of ID1 and ID2, I of that result, I want the following fields, name, address, and of the address, I want the city. You basically query by example, more or less, because you, your query already has the shape of your result. So executing this will give you something like this. You, will have, you have the common friends field on top, you have elements that contain name and address, and every address con consists exactly of the city. If you, for some reason, need deeper levels, you just specify it in the query. So um, to get the friends of the friends of the friends and their names, you would do something like this and get a predictable result. 
what this means is there is no implicit dependencies between those because you have to um, you have to describe the data anyways the data model you have so you know the user has friends and you don't have to know where to fetch those friends you know the user that you can query he has he or she they have friends and um, it will be located under the friends key there will be person object maybe and they themselves could have friends and so on and so on and this remo removes all these things about having to know where stuff is and what to do with information extracted from your thing. You just get a big blob of exactly what you want. So uh, Muse was presented at Euroclosure 2013, 14, I don't know. Um, and that was the same Euroclosure that uh, David Nolan gave a talk about Omnext and introduced the world, or the Closure community, I guess, to GraphQL and uh, the related concepts. And from that moment on, I was, I think the medical term is nerd sniped, because um, I thought, well, we could use the Muse thing to build up rich trees, and we could use GraphQL to query those trees, just cutting off the parts we don't want. So uh, I explored this idea with Claro, which is a library um, that apparently, according to my PR department, allows you to streamline your data access, providing powerful optimizations and abstractions along the way. And it is built upon one simple idea, which is any data structure is a data source. It might just produce the same data all over again. Integer one would produce the integer one. Um, but it means you can write stuff like that. Just saying, okay, I want to have friends one and friends two keys, and they're all friends of something. And the result will be the resolved version of that. You don't have to do fetch friends of one and friends of two and then bring it together again. Uh, which would be something like this in Muse. Uh, the other idea is that data sources, they can just produce more data sources, which is a very natural thing to do, uh, because that's how we think about things. Things are related to other things. Entities are related to other things. So in uh, Claro, you can just say, OK, fetch the user and then ASOC the friends key in there. And the friends key is friends of that specific user. And that's where it belongs. The entity itself, it knows best what relations it has. And why would I have to know, know that? Now, the problem with that, and this uh, eventually leads to fewer FMAP calls, just in case. But you might be fetching unnecessary data because suddenly you have friends off in there, and if you resolve the user record, uh, it will be resolved as well. And it gets worse because data sources can now produce infinite trees. If data sources can produce other data sources, they must, might just produce themselves again. And suddenly you have infinite trees, because friends of are clearly person records, or user records in this case. So if I fetch a user, everything explodes. For this, Claro offers something like tree projections that take an infinite tree and they provide an abstract description of how to transform the tree. In the simplest case, selection. So from the result, please just give me those keys. ID, name, friends, and of each friend, give me uh, the name. If you run this, you get a result that matches your projection. There's also something like merging. You can take an existing projection and say, okay, give me this plus this, the union of both. And this leads to tree projections being very composable. You can reuse the existing part. You can do inline transformations. You can say, oh, fetch this subtree, then transform it, for example, counting in this case, and give me the result. So it's a superset of what GraphQL offers you. And the result will look just like the one you asked. Now, the idea in Claro thus is you create one rich, reusable, infinite tree of data. It's just one tree. It exposes your whole world, several routes, that you can freely choose, and then you select and transform the parts you need ad hoc. Now, if you look at this function, it just takes the view, the view information that um, you want to display, it builds a projection out of it, it applies the projection to your world, to your root value, and then it runs it and produces a result. You might be familiar with this piece of code. It might have appeared in a similar form in the beginning. Because a Claro data source looks like this. Nicely round, nicely gray. And I can ask it for a tree, and it will give me a tree. 
I can ask it for a red tree or some other kind of tree, and it will give me a red or some other kind of tree. And this is the perfect data source, very unopinionated. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, thanks for the talk. And quick question: Would you say that uh, Muse and Orania are, are production ready right now, or still very much in development? Um, I don't know of anyone who's using them in production. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I can only give you an information about the Claro thingy because we have been using that in production now for a few months and um, are working on a bigger project, also GraphQL based, on that Claro thing. And it seems to be working okay, but I don't want to give any strong promises there either. It's, I don't think anyone's really using them. No. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much.